Now, we've been talking quite a lot about the James Webb Telescope and all of its discoveries. But in order to understand and appreciate the successes from the James Webb, it's also important to look at some of the history of space telescopes. Mostly because all of the ideas and all of the successes of James Webb come from the legacy, the 50-year-old legacy, of various telescopes before it. And specifically in this video, we're going to be focusing on this, the Copernicus Telescope. Because just a few days ago, it was its 50th anniversary. This right here was launched 50 years ago. And in some sense, this right here represents a kind of a grandfather of James Webb and the father of Hubble Telescope. This was the first, the heaviest and the most complex space telescope of its time. And so in this video, let's talk a little bit more about the history of these telescopes, discuss the Copernicus, and briefly talk about how all of this led to James Webb. And so, I guess let's start with 1946. Back then, Lyman Spitzer that you see right here, started to essentially speculate about the possibility of one day having some kind of a space telescope. Very likely placed somewhere in orbit around the planet, and very likely being extremely efficient because it would not have to deal with the atmosphere of the planet. His initial ideas eventually led to some of the modern ideas behind the Hubble telescope. And as a side note, you might have heard the name Spitzer before. And that's because he actually has a telescope named after him. The Spitzer telescope, which actually operated for at least 17 years between 2003 and 2020, and was extremely good at analyzing various cold clouds in outer space. To some extent, this was also a kind of a father for the James Webb. This was an infrared telescope. But back then, in the 40s and the 50s, we still knew very little about the outer space and even our own solar system. As a matter of fact, back then, only one source of X-rays was known to us, our own sun. The scientists believe that the X-rays are actually kind of rare out there and it's going to be almost impossible to find them. But by early 60s, by 1962, this was proven to be incorrect. Some of the early launches with what's known as the sounding rockets discovered that there were actually quite a lot of X-ray sources out there. And one of the first ones was one of the most exciting ones. It was what you see right here. This is known as the Cygnus X-1. Here's actually what it kind of looks like with some of the modern X-ray telescopes. This is with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And today we are pretty certain that this is essentially the first black hole ever discovered. This is what's known as an X-ray binary, and it's basically a black hole orbiting a very large, very powerful star, where the black hole in this case absorbs a lot of the mass and then ends up emitting it as two very powerful, very, very bright astrophysical jets that we see from planet Earth. And the X-rays are produced here as well. And just a few years later, there was also the first confirmation for a new type of an object, a neutron star. This was actually one of the bigger discoveries of the time, with the astronomer Jocelyn Bell that you see right here making the official discovery back in 1967. And both of these objects were believed to produce a lot of different emissions, including X-rays, and so the scientists realized that, well, maybe we should try to launch an X-ray telescope into outer space in order to observe some of these objects, while also being able to detect other wavelengths, such as, for example, UV light, that's very difficult to detect from the surface of the planet because of the atmosphere. And so in other words, the scientists wanted to propose a kind of a space satellite, space telescope, to observe these frequencies that are invisible from the surface. And they named this mission OAO, Orbiting Astronomical Observatory, with the initial version being fitted with the ultraviolet telescope, X-ray telescope, and gamma-ray telescope on board. But unfortunately, the first launch did not go as planned. This particular version failed after three days in space, and the second version failed to reach orbit completely. But NASA tried again and launched OAO version 2, the mission named Stargazer. And this essentially became a kind of a pioneering mission that would test some of the new technologies, including ultraviolet observations. They would start making new discoveries about various types of gas in the solar system and even outside of the solar system. For example, one of the main discoveries here was that the comets are usually surrounded by enormous halos of hydrogen gas, several hundred thousand kilometers across. This was not known until this particular mission. But more importantly, this was the first test needed in order to establish if this particular technology can even work in observing outer space. And it looked like the answer was yes, a resounding yes. And so NASA decided to launch another one, OAOB, but unfortunately, this hundred million dollar mission re-entered the atmosphere and broke up because of a very small flaw in one of the explosive bolts that was supposed to separate parts of the spacecraft. 
And so a hundred dollar mistake cost the scientists hundred million dollars. But it didn't stop them from trying again. And on 21st of August 1972, practically 50 years ago, they launched the third mission, OAO-3, later renamed Copernicus. Because it just so happens that it was also the 500 year anniversary of one of the most prominent early astronomers, Nicolaus Copernicus of Poland. And this proved to be the most successful early mission for the space telescope science. It lasted for nearly 10 years and was a major collaboration between NASA, the United Kingdom and several other scientists from around the world. But more importantly, this was the heaviest, the most complex, multi-wavelength telescope produced at that time. It had the largest ultraviolet telescope, the most complex X-ray instrument, and was designed for longevity and to observe things that we could not see from planet Earth. And it just so happens that this telescope and the entire mission was also managed by the iconic Nancy Grace Roman. Known as the mother of Hubble, pretty much all of the lessons and shortcomings on Copernicus helped Nancy Grace Roman design the Hubble telescope, with her also being the main driving force for not just continuing these missions, but actually literally forcing the scientists to come up with better, bigger and more efficient telescopes for decades to come. So the only reason James Webb even exists is really because of her. And to commemorate her legacy, NASA decided to name the next version of the most advanced telescope entirely in her honor. It's going to be known as the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, very likely launched sometimes in 2026, maybe 2027. But when it comes to Copernicus, because of its extremely powerful UV instrument, it was able to produce quite a lot of new discoveries about various types of interstellar gas and various types of ionized gas that nobody could ever even imagine before. As a matter of fact, most of the information we have today about the interstellar gas, about various types of intergalactic gas, came from these early observations. So for example, some of the discoveries about early star formation, how stars evolve, what happens in various molecular clouds, all of this came from Copernicus, with the star known as Zeta Ophiuchi being one of the first targets where all of this was discovered eventually leading to a lot of discoveries about how stars evolve, how stars form from early molecular clouds, and what happens to this gas afterwards when the stars go supernova or when they expand their shells. But unfortunately some instruments, specifically longer wavelength instruments, were not really operating very well. For one reason nobody could predict. A lot of these instruments were unexpectedly receiving a lot of background radiation coming from the region known as Geocorona a kind of a comet-shaped cloud of hydrogen surrounding our own planet. And as the scientists later learned, this actually ends up scattering a lot of the UV light and a lot of other emissions, making certain observations slightly difficult, but also obviously causing certain other effects, such as for example bombarding the moon with all of these charged particles, which then create new compounds on its surface. We actually talked about this in some of the previous videos that should be in the description. But because of this discovery, all of the future telescopes then included a kind of a special filter in order to avoid this interference. Furthermore, some of the early experiments have also finally confirmed the existence of mysterious pulsars, the objects that were only seen in radio emissions prior to this. And this was also the first confirmation that neutron stars were real and so were the black holes. The first pulsar ever confirmed was this one here, Ex Persei, a pulsar that moves really slowly. It takes about 14 minutes per pulsation. This was also the first time ever the scientists were able to observe an actual explosion of a white dwarf that produced a nova observed in 1975. And so a lot of these phenomena that we kind of take for granted today were actually still a huge novelty back then, with the scientists actively trying to understand and explain what they were observing. But in 1981, this observatory was officially retired, even though technically it's still orbiting somewhere around the planet. Nevertheless, its observations had a profound effect on science and on astronomy as a whole. The actual observations have been mentioned in at least 600 different scientific papers, and in those 9 years it was able to observe over 400 unique objects, discovering a lot of new concepts in the process. And following its retirement, all of the scientists from this mission then started to work on the Hubble telescope, which eventually launched approximately 10 years later. But naturally, after the Hubble telescope and all of the lessons learned during this mission, we now have the new generation, the James Webb Space Telescope, to some extent making this the father and this the grandfather of James Webb. And so it's kind of mind-blowing that we had over 50 years 
of space telescopes operating around the planet, providing us with so much data that would be otherwise invisible to us. In the process, helping us discover so many strange and unusual phenomena we never knew existed. And, more importantly, providing all of these lessons that can now be used for future missions. And so I can only imagine what we're going to be able to observe in the next few decades. Assuming, of course, there is a continuous interest in these scientific missions, and all of the future missions can get necessary funding to continue the incredible legacy of all of these beautiful telescopes. And so, I guess, happy anniversary, Copernicus. It was launched just over 50 years ago, and it led to everything we have today. Most of the understanding of the universe we have was really thanks to these early observations and thanks to these incredible missions. But because of all of the recent successes from the James Webb, I wanted to make sure that we don't forget Copernicus and all of its successes as well. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.